And we start our last but not the least of our panel discussions with uh, Mats Fredriksson that most of you know, I think, as the Executive Director of the Arctic Economic Council. Mats, that will be my introduction. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we, uh, we will try something new. It's not going to be death by PowerPoint, but there will be a lot of slides. And the idea is that these slides will be shared with all of you uh, later. And the goal of this panel is that we will not reach 945 on that uh, CO2 measurement over there, because that's the moment when cognitive uh, uh, sense goes down 15%, according to uh, recent research and Pitri's, uh, the Finnish Arctic Ambassador's very well uh, Twitter account. So that's the goal of this panel, to keep that number below 945, which also means this panel is not going to last one and a half hour, don't worry but we will have an exciting panel focusing on innovation. And my name is Mass Fredriksen from the Arctic Economic Council. And this is my favorite map of all times because this map shows the trading routes in the Arctic in the year 700. So just when, when people are talking about Arctic futures and what is the future of the Arctic, just to say we have done trading in the Arctic since the year 700 and much, much more. And Talking about that, this is one of my favorite Arctic innovations. So what you see on the left is the first lightweight rain jacket in the world, invented by the Inuits in Greenland. It's a 170 gram, completely waterproof, and it was really Arctic innovation. What you see on the right is some of the first snow glasses uh, used in the world. Again, also from Greenland, made from the indigenous people there, and this is truly Arctic innovation going first place. So even though we're going to talk about very much about the future, we also have to remember that Arctic innovation is a thing that has been there for thousands of years. Um, the dry suit on the right, also from Greenland. On the left, I love this one, this is when you go away whale hunting. When it gets wet on one side, you turn it around, you got thumbs on the other side, so you can get wet twice on the, on the same gloves. You know, this is Arctic innovation, a glove with two thumbs. So for me, Arctic innovation, when we look at the Arctic innovation, it's very much having a natural advantage. So that's like access to fisheries, access to the blue economy, access to mining. It can be the location of the planet. And then it's using technology. So what we will hear about from all these panelists is the Arctic has some natural advantage, but we need to add on technology. That's when it becomes value, and that's when we increase the competitiveness. And just a reminder for all of you that didn't go to business school, the definition of, of innovation is, is ideas times execution. So if you just have an idea, you just have an idea. To make it innovation, you need to execute, you need to deliver. And again, we have a great panel of people who are actually have ideas and who are executing. Oh, sorry. So, and I will not spend too much time on the theory, but just to say there's different kinds of innovation. There's radical innovation, disruptive innovation, and so on. And it all depends on the impact of the market or the technology. So, for example, an existing technology is LKB in Sweden. They have been producing iron mines for 130 years. Uh, that's an existing technology. Uh, now they're using hydrogen, which is also an existing technology. Uh, but it will definitely have an impact for... for um, for, for LKB, you got carices from Iceland, uh, completely new technology using fish skin uh, as a, as a band-aid so for burn wounds. They basically take the skin of the cod and put it on burn wounds. Uh, it might not have a massive impact on the market, but it's a, it's a, it's a new technology. Um, you can take battery production. Uh, battery production is an existing technology, but the scale and the impact it will have on the market is massive. So we have Freyr in Moirana, we have Northvolt in Sweden. These kind of battery productions will have a massive impact on, on, on technology. And then we got completely new technology that have a massive impact. This is Carbfix from, from Iceland. So it's basically taking uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and shooting it into rocks, and the rocks will absorb the CO2. So this is how we're going to get rid of a lot of CO2, is shooting it into rocks in Iceland. So it's a brand new technology that will have a massive impact on the market. And innovation is also the ability to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. And this town is the town of Berlevog in North Norway. Uh, used to be a, a lively fishing community. Now, uh, because of industrial fishing, they don't have the same am amount anymore. And people were leaving the town. There's 700 people. What they did is they looked around, they said, what do we have that no one can take away from us? 
because everyone was talking about this community being dead. And they said, we have a lot of wind. We have a constant wind blowing all the time. So they decided to build 15 wind turbines. Then everyone got heated floors. They got a nice swimming pool in Berlevog. You should really go and visit. And then they realized we have too much energy. We simply have too much energy. So what do you do? You build 12 more wind turbines. So why did they do that? They did this because they realized that hydrogen was going to be the future. So in Berlevog, a town of 700 people, and this is not a, again, this is being executed as we speak. They have the funding, they have the finance, this is happening. They are building a hydrogen plant, uh, also with support from Horizon 2020 and EU funding. But it's really taking you know, what many people see as a threat and turn it into an opportunity. So this panel, uh, what we will do here is we will do a SWOT of Arctic innovation. So each of the panelists will give a short introduction to their company, where they come from, how they see Arctic innovation. <laughs> And all of them have been so kind to give some inputs to how they see Arctic innovation. So we will plot in Arctic innovation on this. We will end up with a very long slide. You will have it all. And it's basically a PhD project that we will develop here in the next 45 minutes about what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to Arctic innovation. Um, each speaker will probably not dwell so much at each of their bullets in the SWOT, but we will discuss that in the end. And we will also do something revolutionary at an Arctic conference, and that is that we're actually going to start with the weaknesses and the threats. So instead of just saying, you know, how everything is so fantastic, we're actually going to say, you know, but we, it's not only good. You know, we do have some weaknesses in the Arctic, even though we don't like to talk much about it. So that will be the beginning of the group discussion. But without further ado, I would like to uh, invite more that you have already met on stage to talk a little bit about more uh, about containing greens and how they work with Arctic innovation. More, the state podium is yours. Can I have the... Yeah. Just click. I'm just... Ah, get in the I'm not that long, so... <laughs> um, so thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit more about our company Containing Greens. I'm not the only one in the company, even if it's only me on the pictures, I will show you, and I'm the only one here. But we are a very, very good team uh, behind the company. Um, the green one. The green. The big one. Okay. The big one. Green one. Ah, <laughs> okay. So, uh, just to start, the business idea. What we are doing is that we are developing cultivation techniques for the Arctic. And how we actually started the company was not through an idea of, uh, yeah, to find something, to do something good for, for a product. Uh, we were actually looking into a question. So it was a summer job in the beginning. Uh, the question was, find a problem that Northern Sweden stands in front of in the future and solve it. So it was a big question and we were starting and searching in what, what can we actually do and what can actually help the society to do something better. Uh, for Norrbotten. Uh, we're placed in Luleå, uh, as you all know, maybe. Uh, it's a place of data centers. We have the big Facebook uh, data center in Luleå. Uh, it's the one that connects all uh, the European uh, businesses. So data centers is a very big part of our society, as well as a lot of other industries, uh, like mining. Uh, we have now uh, green steel production. There is a lot of things happening in Lulio right now. What we looked into was the self-sufficiency. So we have a lot of people living in northern Sweden, but do we actually have food for them to eat? And the answer was absolutely not. 6% uh, of all the food that produce, that's, uh, 6% of all the food that the people in Norrbotten eats is produced in Norrbotten. So about 95% is imported. So it, when we looked into the resilient, uh, resilience of Norrbotten, we are very low at just uh, food production. We wanted to make this increase, but how? Uh, to grow outside is not easy in the northern climates. We have snow, we have cold, we don't have that much sun. Uh, so the harvesting season is very short. <coughs> to grow in uh, greenhouses is also an opportunity, but we have something that, that makes it a bit harder. So you have to heat the greenhouses during winter time, and that's not something that is economically sustainable. And thereby, the greenhouses we have in Orbotten today, they are not operative from November until about March, April. So during that time, we only import the greens. 
Um, we were starting to look at, okay, we, we want to grow more in an Oboten. We want to do it locally, but how can we actually do it? So we connected the dots of the data centers that produces a lot of heat and they don't use it uh, at all. Uh, as our uh, mentor said, that they, we are actually feeding the crows uh, the heat instead. So we connected that to the greenhouses and started building our pilot facility two years ago. Uh, you see it in the pictures. We grow vertically in hydroponic systems. So we're only using water and nutrition for the greens. Uh, thereby, we're not... Um, we don't use any, any strange things to grow the plants. It's very n natural for them to grow up in. We are trying to be more specifically into kale, not so much salads maybe that other uh, vertical farmers are doing. Uh, because we think kale is more nutritious, it's something we can actually eat as a meal. Uh, we can see it in Asia, it's very much more um, something they eat a lot more than we do in Sweden right now. We have uh, green kale, we have black kale, we have a lot of different uh, types of it, and we're trying all of them right now, as well as some uh, herbs as well, because of the restaurants that uh, buys from our pilot facility right now. And as you can, uh, as you tasted the parsley before. Um, so what we are doing more specifically is the hydroponic vertical cultivation system. We have uh, lead grow lights, we have a control system and the heat capture system. So this is kind of the, the product features that we are trying to, to make to a total uh, greenhouse. Uh, behind this, there is a lot of other things that we are focusing on. So the industrial symbiosis is the most important thing for us. Uh, we are looking into reuse of um, materials that it is not used anymore. So data centers is a not so good industry when you're looking into how much materials they actually use and that they actually throw out all of their technology every third year because you don't want any problems in a data center. So thereby you, you re uh, take something else instead. So we are looking into building uh, our own grow lights. We are growing building our own uh, vertical systems uh, by using materials that is already used once. Uh, the control system is very important. Uh, we need to have a lot of more control of our plants, but it also makes it possible for us to grow during uh, nighttime instead of daytime. So a lot of vertical farmers uh, meets the critique of being energy, um, using a lot of energy. Uh, but to solve that, we are trying to make the plants grow during nighttime when the energy nets are not that loaded as in daytime. Uh, the heat capture system is the most important. We use a data center. Okay. Can I go back? Yeah. Uh, we use data center heat uh, right now in the pilot facility, but there is a lot of other industries as well that can use our kind of uh, greenhouses. This is uh, my version of uh, the business model. Um, so right now we are the greenhouse, uh, but we are looking into more of the whole system behind it. So we're not only focused on our product, we're also looking into how to make it sustainable for the social uh, part as well. So we are working with uh, something we call DC farmers. It's a new type of, uh, of uh, workers. So we are educating people to be able to work in the uh, greenhouses in the future. And that's something that doesn't exist in Norrbotten right now. Uh, we were actually told to go down to southern Sweden to get educated. Uh, but we think that's too far and we want to do it locally. So that's why we have started this project with the municipality. Yes. So waste heat is, uh, you can see in the picture here, um, we have the last years, it's kind of boomed with data centers in Orbotten. Why, you can ask yourself, it's because of the cold uh, climate. It's very good for cooling down their uh, businesses and also for their green electricity. So right now we have 200 plants. It's not that much, it's very small. Uh, we are going to uh, go up until, yeah, in the beginning of next year and scale up. 
but the big question is for us uh, that we want to do it large scale. Uh, we want to make it possible for Luleå uh, and for northern Sweden, but also for the rest of the Arctic uh, climate zone to be able to grow vegetables all year round. So next year we will start our first investment round and hope to be able to expand very soon. Thank you. And, and you will see this from each speaker has, has contributed to this. Um, so this is the SWOT from, from Containing Greens about Arctic innovation. And we will debate that in the panel. We put everything into to one panel in the end. But just to say, we'll get back into this. But this is the important part. The next speaker, so we're going from a, from a small, uh, small, startup in a small startup in the Arctic to a very, very large uh, company from the Kingdom of Denmark that is also operating in the Arctic. The Arctic is so important that it's actually mentioned in their strategy that the Arctic is a key focus area for their business. So I would like to invite Severin to, to come on stage and speak about Terma. So we go from a, from a company of three employees soon to a company of very several employees around the world. Severin? Hi. Um, so my name is uh, Severin. As you, uh, yeah. innovation, right? Ideas and implementation. So, so my name is Severin. As you can guess, I'm not uh, Danish, and uh, I'm not from the Arctic. Actually, I think moving to Belgium was my uh, biggest uh, leap to the high north. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm here. So I represent Terma. Uh, for those who don't know Terma, this is uh, Denmark's uh, biggest uh, defense uh, industry. Uh, we are active in the fields of uh, aeronautics, uh, radars, uh, space, and uh, cross-domain technologies such as artificial intelligence. And I'm mostly going to focus my, uh, my presentation uh, on this. Uh, also, for your information, we have a podcast. Uh, for those who don't know what a podcast is, it's like radio, but you can pause it. Uh, this podcast is called uh, Allies in Innovation and uh, we have two episodes about the, the Arctic. So, uh, just to, to start with, uh, from a defense innovation perspective, the challenge in the Arctic is to uh, know what's going on, what we call situation awareness. So, uh, to create situation awareness, you need three things. First, uh, you need to develop and build the uh, appropriate uh, sensors to collect the data from uh, multiple sources. And by sensors, we mean radars, uh, we mean uh, drones, uh, satellites, uh, whether they are air or underwater, um, etc. Then you need to have the network or the bandwidth to transfer this data in near real time or in real time. And finally, you need to have the capabilities to process the data, so through uh, algorithm and uh, using data fusion uh, technologies. So that's a bit to, to say the stage of the presentation. And now I will uh, actually dive into the, the SWOT. So I, I will start with the weaknesses or the challenges. So as you know, the Arctic is a, an extreme uh, environment uh, because of the size of the territory, four times the size of France, apparently. Uh, the natural conditions and the lack of infrastructures, especially IT and uh, communication uh, infrastructures. So this has two consequences uh, for us. First, you need to develop sensors that are robust enough to uh, endure the extreme uh, temperature and the extreme weather. But also, these sensors need to be as self-sufficient as possible, because you cannot go every day check on these devices and do the maintenance. And in addition, we also need to uh, bear in mind that it's impossible to strive for a perfect situation awareness, because the, the area is too big. So we need to choose where do we put the sensors and how do we get the maximum out of them. And so that's why the combination of radars, satellites, uh, drones, etc., is very important, without mentioning the whole connectivity uh, challenges. The second uh, challenge is, is about the, the learning cur curve. As you know, all, the, all of these uh, data-driven technologies are based on the machine learning and training your systems to be fit for purpose and fits to the need of the, of the users. So for instance, it would be quite embarrassing if your alert system which goes off every time it, what it thinks is a drone is actually a bird. And that's something we are able to do at Terma, making the distinctions between, uh, between the two. Um, data fusion also uh, quite of a challenge. Uh, you need certain level of standardizations to make the, the whole things uh, work. 
So now I'm moving to the threat. So of course, strategic competitions. Uh, I'm, I don't think I need to develop on why strategic competition, but just the, the consequences of this is the time constraints. Uh, because of these uh, strategic competitions, uh, you know, uh, competitors become stealthier and more furtive, which means that you need to all the time to oppose some new innovation or some a new level of innovation, a new level of uh, detection uh, technologies. So which means the innovation cycles is being shortened. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other uh, threats that I actually put is also investments in the sense that, of course, if you're lacking investment, uh, that's also a problem on the long term because you will uh, lose the upper hand on the, on the competitors. So that's for the threats. Uh, let me go to the, to the strength. Uh, so, of course, for Terma, uh, the Danish company, uh, the Arctic is uh, nothing uh, new. And uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we, we are also not uh, starting from, uh, from scratch. Uh, we are actually one of the very few companies in Europe who, are, who is able to integrate different systems from land, air, sea, space and create what we call systems of systems. So we don't produce everything ourselves, but we are able to make a product out of different other products and fits to the, to the user's uh, needs. And this is thanks to uh, experience, human expertise, uh, experience in uh, various uh, projects uh, to see better, faster, and uh, being able to react uh, yeah, faster. So just to, to mention the projects, I'm not going to develop on them, but we are part of the NATO AGS, Allied Ground uh, Surveillance. Uh, we are doing predictive analytics uh, for maritime security. Uh, we are leading the AI for Defense uh, projects. It's an EU uh, EDIDP uh, project. And finally, we are at the moment, there is a Danish Swedish cooperation on a project called uh, Bifrost, uh, aimed at putting edge computing on satellites. So there are different way of uh, different uh, levels of innovations in uh, our uh, activities. Um, another uh, strength is the strong partnership with uh, end users. As you know, AI is about uh, adapting, um, uh, how to say, the problems change over time, so you need to adapt your products very often. And for this, you need to have uh, use end users' feedback. That's why we have a strong cooperation with the Danish Armed Forces, and in particular with the Joint uh, Operational Center at uh, the Archie Command in Nuuk, and this helps us improving our, uh, our products. And let me finish with the, uh, with the opportunities. Uh, first, of course, the benefits of uh, dual-use uh, technologies. So situation awareness uh, technologies are, of course, needed for military use, but actually they have more use than just the military. Uh, it has civilian benefits, for instance, uh, ensuring or checking what are the safe uh, shipping routes, conducting search and rescue operations, uh, uh, doing earth observations, and monitoring climate change effects. So say it differently, if you invest in dual-use technologies, it has a greater value and a, a greater purpose than just uh, military uh, objectives and, and needs. And of course, the last one, since there is more attention on the Arctic, uh, we can expect and we are already seeing more uh, partnership, uh, new types of uh, cooperation. And for instance, at Terma, we, we believe that maybe within the European Defense Fund program, we could uh, insert uh, uh, having a dedicated project uh, for, for the Arctic, uh, tackling, uh, tackling situation awareness. And at the same time, of course, the upcoming uh, office, uh, European Commission office in Nuuk can also be a good, uh, another way to strengthen the industry uh, dialogue in the, in the region. So I will, uh, I will stop there. Uh, thank you, and of course, uh, available to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have been on land, we have been in space, now we are going underwater, we are focusing on fishery. Uh, and I would like to invite Tor up from the, from the Faroe Islands, from the, from the Research Council, from a fishing company and a man who has studied innovation both uh, academically but also uh, in real life. Tor. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I have uh, two hats. Uh, I am uh, the CMO of the largest, largest fishing company in the Faroes, fishing uh, pelagic fish. Um, herring, mackerel, blue-eyed ink, and capeling. And um, I'm also the chair of the Ferris uh, Research and Innovation Council. Um, Ferris, imagine a society, tiny, 55,000 people, remote, uh, Arctic weather, bad, bad weather, uh, no minerals, no gold, no oil, but a higher GDP than 
10 mark per capita. Uh, one reason is innovation, and one reason is God given circumstances with uh, uh, fish and salmon farming. Um, first, a little bit up, about Varen. Varen, uh, we, it, we operate boats like that. Uh, the fish is uh, cooled in refrigerated salt water down to minus 1.5 degrees. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, processed at our factory on the southernmost island, island Suwaroi. Uh, we use uh, vert, uh, vertical freezers and uh, IQF freezers. And it's packed in uh, blocks. Uh, it's uh, fillets and whole fish and uh, headed and gutted. And it's sold worldwide. Uh, often we think that nothing happens in the fishing industry. And, and this, uh, but if we look back a little, uh, this figure shows the, the number of people uh, in, the, in the Faroese seafood industry in salmon farming and fishing on land and on board. On total, it was in 85, 11,000 people. And today, and in, in, in 2016 as well, it was 5,500, so half. But the production is much larger. So something is happening. If we uh, think about CO2 uh, emission and fish, then there is no protein as efficient as pelagic fish. Uh, uh, it, it is one, one tenth or less of what the, the CO2 emission for chicken, for example. So if you want to keep a, a, a clean conscience, eat herring or mackerel. Um, yeah, as, as uh, Mas told, uh, told you, uh, I've done research in, in fishing. I was comparing fishing uh, and salmon farming. These industries have things in common. It's about net, it's about fish, it's about the ocean and waves and so on. But they're also very different. Fishing is traditional. Uh, it's built on tradition, as many of the, of the industries in, in the Arctic uh, areas. But salmon farming is 40 years old and is built on research. Uh, and it produces also different kinds of innovation. Innovation the, in, in fishing are mostly incremental, uh, and in salmon farming they, are, uh, they tend to be more uh, radical in nature. It is the, the fishing organizations uh, do not have an R&D uh, department, rarely, I should say rather, but, uh, but uh, R&D is, is in the heart of the, of the salmon farming industries. And, and um, the most important knowledge in fishing is tacit knowledge, experience-based knowledge. It's the fishermen who know their craft. And in salmon farming, it's a variety of, of knowledges. And, 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 uh, and there's an effective uh, strategic knowledge integration. New knowledges are in, uh, implemented in the systems all the time. Um, One thing that is very important to, to the innovations in my study is, is proximity. Uh, you can reach 80% of the fishing and salmon uh, companies and all the suppliers of both knowledge and products within 30 minutes. So it can't be more um, close. And 80%, and I, I, in my study, I, I was uh, investigating 35 innovations, and 80% and, um, of them were were conducted or performed in a cluster context. So it was not only uh, this company or only that company, but it was often three up to five companies that were performing the innovations together. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and, and secondly, if the knowledge or the product was not available, then such a tiny society, that happens, uh, the, the companies have um, uh, yeah, a compensation strategy, which is to go where it's found. And in fishing, it is, it is often in Denmark or Iceland or Norway. And in salmon farming, there are very, very close ties between the salmon farming organizations and uh, researchers, especially in Norway. And both parts benefit from it. 
because the various organizations are, are innovative. Um, this is, uh, I'll, I'll now tell you briefly about three innovations. This is uh, the Ferris uh, company called Hidden Fjord. It's the first company to produce small, uh, sorry, big smalt. It's the most radical innovation in salmon farming in at least 20 years, uh, and, and everybody is doing it now. It, it started uh, in, in practice uh, in 2010, but actually it started in 2008. So normally you put a smalt like this into the ocean. So it's a small station, which is a profit center, and, and, and so we can then ask why did they not produce bigger smalt before? They did it almost by accident in the Faroes in, in eight, and they found, okay, it's possible to do it, but they stopped to do it for, for some time because they, did, they didn't see the advantages and they thought it was too expensive, but it is not too expensive uh, per, uh, per kilo finished product, but it's too expensive for one small, so you have to look at correctly at the calculations, which, which nobody did. And, and the advantage uh, was doubling the, the turnover with the same fjords and the same rivers. So it's significant. And now everybody is doing this. This one is uh, uh, from our island. You saw the factory there. Uh, there are 4,500 people living there, and uh, our factory there is using more energy than the whole island. There are four sources of energy, uh, water, uh, oil, uh, wind, and sun. Uh, and uh, the, the, the former, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, Joaquin, he's called, he, he was in, in the presenting before. He's the director of this company, Sev, who's performing this. Um, so they have built a, a battery station, and, and uh, this, this figure, the, oh, the, the, the orange line shows the frequency, and, you, and uh, it's from 11 to, to 2 in the afternoon, the 25th of August, and you see that, that at about 11.30, the, the oil, the black line on, on the, there is stopping, so now the wind is high enough. So the wind is a green one, and, and it's, it's uh, high enough, and then it goes down, and when it goes down, the battery is charging all the time, and then the batteries are turning on. So the batteries are not producing for a long time, but they, they are uh, making sure that uh, that is the right frequency. And, uh, okay. and in, in, uh, in October, uh, they produced, uh, yeah, 85% was green uh, energy. Uh, this one, uh, I will use one and a half minutes for it on it. Uh, this one is a, a totally tacit uh, innovation. Uh, imagine uh, a Eiffel Tower. A troll is like an Eiffel Tower. It's pointy at one end and it's big on, on the other. And uh, where it's big, it's like f four football fields, how big it is. And, and imagine that there's a, there's a school of uh, herring entering the troll and when it comes to the cut end, to the, where the fish is contained, before that it's called the belly. There, the, the meshes are eight, 80 millimeters big, and when they're too big, it come, becomes like that. They call it stickers, so they, they almost ruin the, the, the trawl. So what, what do you do? Well, you, you uh, lower the, the mesh, you make the meshes smaller. You change that part of it to smaller meshes. But what happens? What happens when you put a barrel in the, in the ocean? It's heavy. But what happens when you put a barrel in the ocean and there's a hole in it? It's not heavy. So what I did, there were, there were two captains on, on a boat called Finofrite of ours who said, you know what? When the herring uh, gets stressed, it turns upwards. And all the other captains were laughing. Ha, 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 yes, you're, you're good. Uh, but uh, the, so how did they know that? This is 500 meters in the ocean. It's black, and no camera can see anything. And nobody in the world knew this. But they said, it is like that. Just change the troll so it's 60, 60 millimeters here, only, only on the top, and then keep it 80. And it was <laughs> sold. That's, uh, that's tacit knowledge, that you get ideas from, from, from there, here, and there, and you know things that other people don't know. Thank you very much, Tor.
Again, if you were one, if you're wondering what is the Swatch of Tour is here and is here for salmon farming. And I think the key point of what he said was clusters, you know, clusters and networks. And that's why we will actually go to a cluster within the seafood industry, I mean, within the bioeconomy, within the biotech, biotech north, Alina will come and speak. And, and I think the key here is we heard about sustainable fishing and how to be, but it's also how to use more of the fish, how to use more of the seafood. That's what Lena will speak about now. Thank you so much, uh, Mats, and thank you for the invitation of coming here. I will try to give uh, some uh, input on how we in the Cluster Biotech North see the possibilities and, and challenges um, when it comes to innovations from, from the ocean. And because I don't have so much time, and Mats uh, warned us that uh, he was going to be very strict. You're not so strict uh, yet, Mats, oh, so maybe I will be the first one. So I will try to be, <laughs> be quick. So I will try to use one example. Uh, to, to say some about what we think uh, the possibility is. And I will use Precardix, which you can see on top of the, the picture, um, this product as an example. So this is a product that was developed by a company called Marealis, which is a member of Biotech North Cluster. Their head office is in Tromsø in northern Norway. And Precardix is the world's first natural product with an effect on high blood pressure which is a, a big challenge in the world, too many people with high blood pressure. And it's uh, based on uh, Arctic prawn shell, so the shell that we peel off the, the, the prawn. The parent company uh, is Stella Polaris, and they uh, have been established for many years as an innovative uh, producer of cooked and peeled and frozen prawns. Uh, and they had a big focus on 100% utilization of their raw materials. Then some researchers at Nofema found that the peptides in the prawn shell could influence the, the blood pressure. And then the company Stella Polaris both had the, the raw material and the willingness to invest. And after further years of research and development, they launched the product Precardix. And this supplement has been clinically tested and is approved by Health Canada and FDA in the US. And they have launched it in over 1,000 pharmacies in Canada, and more will come, and also U.S. Uh, and the active ingredients in Precardix is extracted from the raw material before the residues are then again turned into a prawn powder, which can be sold as a flavor enhancer, like a bouillon, or turned into a, a, a meal, which can be used in, as, a fish, as an ingredient for, for a feed for aquaculture, for example. So by this, uh, Stella and uh, Polaris and Maralis managed to both utilize and reuse the entire prawn. So this might seem very simple, uh, but it hasn't been. <laughs> uh, they thought it would take like two years and cost about two million Norwegian kroner to develop this product. They spent over 10 years and at least uh, 50 million uh, Norwegian kroner to, to do this. But isn't a good example of 100% utilization of our, our marine raw materials, but circle economy, but sustainable use uh, of the ocean. And then I would love to talk also in depth about other examples like Arctic Symes Technologies, which produces cold adapted enzymes from marine organisms. Many of the COVID tests that you've been taking the, the last year has had uh, marine enzymes from cod liver originally. You didn't know that, I guess, but many things in there. Nordskin, another company that, uh, in another Norway that produces salmon leather for the fashion industry, but when they take off the, the, the shell from the, the leather uh, or from the skin, that can be used to produce bioplast. And the research group Marbio at the University of Tromsø that have, maybe have found uh, some of the answers to the most aggressive form of breast cancer or antibiotic resistance. And that's found through bioprospecting in the organisms we have in our Arctic Ocean. And also this fascinating project between the University of Tromsø and Finfjur smelter that involves growing marine uh, microalgaes in large tanks located in the industry area of Finfjur. The algae who eat the CO2 from the industrial smoke and at the same time produce important ingredients for fish feed. So there's many, many examples I could uh, give you, but what does these uh, examples say? Well, we have a lot of good sources for raw material, uh, which we can develop high-value products. 
Residual raw materials from the prawn is already mentioned, but of course we had other seafood, both from uh, fishing and from the aquaculture, and also all the organisms we can find through our marine bioprospecting. And through the research, we have shown that there are countless different applications uh, which we can use this raw material for. Medicine, dietary supplements, ingredients for food, feed, cosmetics, and, and so on. And biotechnology and marine biotechnology as a tool is important uh, itself. And it can contribute to greener industry and take care of other industries side stream. Uh, and it shows that um, none of these examples of products and companies would have happened, would have seen the day, day if it hasn't been for governmental support for the right infrastructure and the, the research. We invest a lot in the research cruises uh, and also see a picture from a pilot plant called Biotep, which has been very important for our companies. So they can go to a pilot plant, test the products, scale, uh, instead of uh, investing in their own factories um, uh, too early in the development. So to sum up, is there an easy path from research to commercialization in marine biotechnology? No, absolutely not takes time, takes uh, a lot of money, and has a, a big uh, risk. And I will not go in detail in my SWOT. We can come, come back to that. You can spend less time than you have, so <laughs> amazing. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And as you see, here's the SWOT. Let's give a round of applause to Lina. And, and there, there are a lot more cool companies, as Lena mentioned. And I think that's the challenge of working in Biotech North, is that so many amazing cases to speak about and so little time. So please do reach out to her. But one thing that was the key with Biotech North was it couldn't be done without research. You know, companies don't automatically go to innovation. They need to go through research. And that's why we have one person working within the Research Council in Iceland. So we are covering the whole Nordic region in this panel. So Egil from Ranis, you will now take us to Iceland. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the good thing about being the last speaker in the last panel of a conference is that a lot of things have been covered. So I can jump over a couple of, couple of points I had. But uh, as was mentioned, I'm at the Icelandic Center for Research. And uh, what we do is support research, education, culture, and innovation in Iceland through both funds, uh, running 29 domestic funds, including the Technology Development Fund, and uh, through international cooperation, being, for example, national contact points for Horizon. But I want to start with a quote from 1976, as you do in an innovation panel. I don't go back <laughs> to 800 or 700 or whatever you did, but, but sort of this was the outlook 50 years ago, roughly. So this quote is, uh, Iceland is a rock in the ocean, surrounded by fish, take away the fish, what have you got? and uh, got left. And I mean, the, the quote is from the chief negotiator for Iceland uh, in the last round of the Cod Wars, third round, and sort of underlying how important uh, fish was for the economy in Iceland. And at that time, uh, around 90, per, almost 90% of the export revenues of Iceland was seafood. Iceland, of course, is a small, well, population or has a small population, 360,000. Uh, today, around 95% are living in urban areas, as we would call them. But the infrastructure is, of course, built from this notion of being, first and foremost, fishing village around the countries. So the largest settlement that would not be a fishing village is Eilstadir in the east of Iceland here, having 25,000 people but it's still only 27 kilometers from, say, the spirit, the, the closest port. So in any other country, that would be considered the same region, in a sense. So sort of as a background for this, uh, what we, yeah, the big one, what we see in Iceland sort of in the early 2000s is that sort of these three pillars have been established for the economy, that is seafood, and of course, the catch decreased uh, a lot since well, the Cod Wars to, for example, 2011, but the value, of course, rose quite significantly. Uh, the, the renewable energy, and we had a panel on that earlier. I won't go 
further or deep into that, but of course, I mean, that's what drives the aluminum smelters that were built up and, and for example, this uh, silicon plant, uh, which then turn into export products from, from the renewable power. And then, of course, tourism, which actually had become double what, well, both aluminum and seafood were combined before COVID-19 when it comes to export revenues, almost going up to 50% at the time and place. So the reason for why this was possible was sort of the infrastructure that was built up and by sort of the initiative of these companies, AMSG, Iceland Air, others, and then through sort of these uh, well, governmental run fiber optic cables providing 99% of Icelanders with, with internet. It probably should be 100%, but there are a few that don't want internet, I guess. And, and sort of having Iceland connected, despite being quite remote, although it, it is kind of in the middle, in a sense, when it comes to sort of Europe, North America, and, and further on. Uh, my, my focus here is a bit on what has been discussed earlier when it comes to the cluster idea. And I mean, this is, of course, something that you've seen as a very important boost for seafood energy and tourism in Iceland, especially from sort of the knowledge sector. Uh, what I want to underline are these two charts that you may not see properly, but sort of the, these are then the support actions. So 2.5% of the GDP now, 2.53, goes into research and development. Uh, and the biggest sort of growth has been in then tax deduction for research and development. Yep, research and development projects. And uh, I mean, this is something that companies like in a sense, because there you can actually see tangible results from doing research and development in a monetary way. And Iceland has been very active through the Horizon, Euro, Horizon 2020 program, for example, and, and Georg, this cluster sort of was one, at least I would say one of the main reasons for why Iceland doubled from framework program seven and energy was the boost for that. And around 10% of Icelanders take their university degrees abroad, which brings about sort of this third, uh, fourth pillar, the knowledge industry and sort of the flow of the ideas, flow of ideas. Uh, what, what we see sort of with the value chain in seafood, of course, as has been mentioned, is that we have products that one would probably not have thought of 20 years ago, would ever exist when it comes to medical products, etc. And with the renewable energy, Carpfix was mentioned earlier, uh, as an example, sort of connecting it to these funding systems, uh, they received over 100 million euros grant uh, earlier this year from the European Innovation Council. And Kieresis has also been part of European projects which actually helped them in their growth towards America, for example. So the, these are sort of concrete examples of how this can play together. But, but of course, the main goal is that companies are self-sufficient, etc. But there are steps that, that, well, companies usually go through. And with tourism, what we see is that the companies, of course, become more and more sort of software companies rather than anything else. So just sort of to conclude then, I, I put this cheeky line at the end because I thought everyone would be asleep. So sort of the notion is then that innovation took a rock and turned it into gold and literally sort of for, well, not literally, but for Carbfix, for example, of course, what they're doing is taking CO2 and putting it down to to stones or to the rocks. So sort of this earlier notion 50 years ago or so that Iceland would be nothing without seafood is fortunately not true, but seafood is very important still. Thank Thanks. You. And some, as you see here, Egil has also done a, a, a sort of this. And we also ask the... Um, Northern sparsely populated areas to contribute to this what just to to add in a little bit more information so we have from Sweden we have from Finland as well and then of course the AC also did a, a simple one and then what we did was this so we put all of that 
from the panelists from the northern sparsely populated area from the AEC. We put it all into um, each one. And I will just before so you and, and if you want to get the slides, reach out to me. I'll send you the slides. You can also take photos because we wanted to leave you with more than empty battery on your phones after this session. So we have threats, we have weaknesses. Uh, uh, we have the strengths and we have the opportunities. We have already heard for the past two days a lot about the strengths and opportunities, so we will not be talking about that. But just to say that we got the information, but we're going to start here with the threats. And, and I will ask the panelists and whoever wants to grab the phone who didn't feel that they talked enough can, uh, can grab the, and we will do it one by one with policy, climate, competitiveness, and then the other category. Uh, and I would like to, to mention a lot of you wrote in your SWOT that a threat was policy and regulation. Anyone who would like to elaborate, what can the policymakers, what, what, what is regulation? Why is that a limit to innovation? Feel free to grab the phone. Lena, you are nodding, so please. Yeah, the, the regulation, I mean, the, the innovations are usually ahead of the regulations. That's the, like, the, the fact, that is the way it. Uh, is and if you see for like to give some concrete examples we need uh, novel um, ingredients for for feed for aquaculture that could be using the sludge from the aquaculture to feed insects to make a new ingredients but that's not allowed now but i mean we can do it but it will take time to change the regulation so there's a lot of those examples and for Precodix, uh, which is not a, a medicine, it's a nutraceutical. It's only five health claims you can use in EU when you are uh, promoting a nutraceutical. This is a science-based nutraceutical, uh, which is like have like new results, but there are no health claims out there. So they are just competing as another nutraceutical, which is a very tough business to be in. So to support the, the research-driven innovations, we also need to work with the regulations at the same time for in the business model. If not, they will not succeed. They will just, you know, fall out of the market because you're just competing on marketing, which you should not do. Perfect. And wait, I'll just see if... Wait, maybe not. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and I think you expect the innovation is moving faster than regulation. Innovation is moving faster than regulation. Uh, I just want to ask you more. Have, have you faced any policy or regulation challenges? Because what you're doing is quite new. Uh, using energy and so on. What, or has it just been easy sailing? No, it, it has not been e easy sailing. Um, is the microphone on? Yeah. Yes, good. Um, we have something in Sweden we call kravmerkning. It's a it's a type of um, um, saturation. There we have it. Um, that you can have on uh, on um, on the greens, but we can't have it because we are doing uh, hydroponics, and that's something that is not allowed to be uh, said in Sweden yet. Uh, and also, you can have other regulations in the EU that we cannot uh, say that we are doing an ecological uh, cultivation, but we are, but we cannot say it out loud. Uh, and that's something that we would really like to do, uh, because we are doing it, we are doing it the right way, but it's not up to speed uh, in the regulations yet. So, no, it has not been easy sailing for us either. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I could take uh, the second one, uh, no, the, the first one. Uh, import restrictions to the EU. Um, uh, with uh, sales, it's is, is, is the same as with uh, uh, as proximity, because when, when you sell a product, you have a near market, and it's difficult to start on the opposite, opposite side of the world. Um, we are in the Danish kingdom, but we are not in the EU. Uh, so... In, in a way, re EU re uh, regards us as um, uh, a, a country uh, delivering uh, raw material. So, if, for example, if I cut a, a, a fillet as, of a salmon, uh, it's okay. If I put some uh, citron yeah, seasoning on it, then it's uh, 15 or 25 percent tax on it. So, so it's a we don't see any uh, innovation when it comes to product development because uh, it's, it's difficult to sell the products. Perfect, thank you. And 
before we move to, to the next one, the next slide, the, the last two panelists, you can pick whatever thread you want and you can speak on that if you want for like 30 seconds to a minute. So Egil, if you go. Yeah, just very quickly, maybe on bilateral agreement along with protectionism. I mean, the, these are aspects that, of course, are different between countries within the Arctic. But if you're looking at the backlash of globalization, for example, and sort of export markets that aren't as feasible as they used to be, of course, I mean, this has to do with Russia, of course, but also parts of Asia. Uh, we have, it's, of course, very obvious that the focus area for these sort of innovative products are quite different today than they were maybe 10 years ago. And, and that might affect the value, actually, if you are trying to leverage that. And Severin? Yes. Ah, OK, it's already working. Uh, no, just a small point on the strategic uh, competitions, because I think, the, for me, the regulation is more of a challenge than a threat. But uh, on the strategic competition, one point I forgot to mention, so I explained that we need the products or sensors that are robust for the resisting the extreme temperatures, also as self-sufficient as possible for the maintenance and uh, making sure it works. But another point is also uh, in-product robustness. And what I mean by that is how to avoid uh, information intoxication, distortion, etc. So, which means that when you design the products, you also need to think about how you can uh, yeah, not destroy it, but at least make, make it make it intoxicated. So, for instance, we have strong cybersecurity uh, requirements, and I mean, just like in just like in every company, but this is even more important uh, in a strategic uh, uh, environment. And and Severin pointed about something important here, because if you look through this SWOT, and you will see it when you see it. Some, some things are in strengths that other people set in weaknesses, and other things are actually in opportunities that other people see as threats. And this is the beauty of this, that it really depends how you approach this. So if we, if we go to the weaknesses, um, I would actually say that every single panel doing the Arctic Futures has touched upon some of these, which is competences and skills. We heard the previous panels talking about the people of the Arctic, capital, uh, strategy and cultures and structural challenges. And, and I would like, um, because we won't have time uh, for, for more than just a final, uh, final comment for the panels, that each of the panelists can pick whichever one, whichever one of the weaknesses to speak about. If, and I think competence and skills, capital, strategy and cluster, structural challenges, you know, general headlines, so you can go into specifics. So more, if you want to start about the weaknesses and where we need to improve. So one of our big, uh, big weaknesses is the access to capital uh, in the small, to the smaller companies. So we are a very small company and we're competing with the, the big, big industries. Uh, there is a lot of money that goes in investments to Norbotten right now, but to be able to access it as a small company is very hard. And we kind of have one incubator that uh, controls all of the investments that goes on. So that's uh, something where we can work with and there can be a lot of um, improvements. Perfect, very clear. Tor, do you want to go next? Yes. Um. Yeah, more educated people, or you could say, uh, there are not many educated people. It could be written like that instead. Um, so, so you can say, um, why are there, in the Faroe Islands, there are 0.7% in, in, in the fishing industry or seafood industry, the fishing industry, uh, that, that have a master or a PhD. In salmon farming, the, the number is 3.9%. Uh, so 0 0.7 versus 3.9. It's very, very little. Uh, it, it, it would be good if there were more educated people. Uh, it's also a cultural issue. I, th I guess you will see that in the Arctic, uh, many places. That is like, uh, do we need them, uh, and so on. Thank you. But it's Lina? a fact. So we, we invest a lot of money in, in research. Uh, but then we have all these exciting results, uh, and we have these uh, resources that is unique in the Arctic. Uh, but we don't invest enough in taking them to the next level of, of testing. So we are... We are licensing out fantastic research results for companies in, in the whole world instead of taking them a step further and maybe also make more money and results like coming directly from us. So we should bring our ideas further out, take that risk, 
more often than what we are doing now. Now we're just selling out. To it's related to capital, so capital and risk, risk willing capital. Severin? Yes, maybe. Just quickly, I just want to go back to this uh, Bifrost project, so Danish uh, Swedish project who put edge computing on satellites. Uh, for me, it's just addressing the, the lack of infrastructures because nowadays military satellites, they collect data, but then to download the data, they need to come back to a certain orbit position. And the problem with that is that sometimes it would take, I don't know, five, seven hours to, to come back to the position. And what we are developing at the moment is to have this edge computing on the satellites, which means it can transfer small amounts of data to other commercial satellites. So then you can go faster in the, in the data, uh, data transfer. And it is interesting because when we talk about lack of infrastructures, we think about the ground, but we, we also need to think about the space and everything related to space traffic management, because we all know that there's more and more satellites and flying objects. So that's a challenge. Uh, that's also a challenge for, for us. And I think lack of infrastructure, a lot of SMEs would say the same, and a lot of investors, and everyone would say lack of infrastructure is, is a challenge. Egil, you will get the final. Yeah, I, I will go into the no research and development strategy because, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that's necessarily true, but the interlinks between sort of these research projects and, and their practical use towards innovation is something that, of course, has been developing, but takes time and, and will hopefully develop further into the future. And then, on that happy note, um, as you heard, this was the weaknesses and the threats. They did come up with a lot of opportunities, and those slides are much longer, and the strengths is also much longer. And that's why I also want to leave you with this one, because I got this from the sparsely northern, sparsely populated areas, uh, that actually says there are a lot of investments coming into the Arctic. Uh, this is a recent report, it's not very old, from Olu. Uh, just to say there's a lot of money flowing in, and I just want to end you with this. We need to get the money into the right places, into the right innovation, uh, because there are a lot of things happening in the Arctic. And if you want to, to know more, as I said, notice the strengths and the opportunities, how long that list is. So please do reach out to us to see all the, the good things as well. And let's give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, panelists. Um, we come to a close, it's just a few more minutes. We come to a close of this, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, just the emotions, I guess, 13th edition of the Arctic Future Symposium. Um, before I hand over to Mike, Mike Sfraga, the chair, as you know, of the US Research Commission, for some closing remarks, I would like to thank you for being here, you guests, you panelists, you uh, keynote speakers uh, for being here these last two days. It was a pleasure having you and I also would like to take the opportunity to thank all our partners for setting this up, the team, the teams of the partners and also the teams at the International Polar Foundation. I think you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you very much, all of you. And now I would like Mike to come on stage for some final closing remarks and closing this 13th edition. Thank you very much. So for the next two and a half hours, I'm just going to re <laughs> revamp what we, uh, I, I won't do that to you, nor will I insult you by going through the, all of the, the presentations that our colleagues went through. But I have six, numbers thing, six uh, impressions of the last couple of days, side meetings, uh, breakfasts and dinners, thinking about the program and then some follow-ups. So, and, and these are just really organic. I jotted them down just moments ago. So one is, these are six words. One is a mirror. I know, you're thinking, what? A mirror. Uh, because thinking about the panels and the programs and the discussions, it, it was like somebody holding up a mirror to the things that we all work on, we care about during the day and the evenings, the stuff we worry about at night, wake up to in the morning. And for people who live in the North, what they heard and saw was a mirror of what, what we're all trying to impact and affect and address. So that's what I heard over the last couple of days, it was a mirror. Another word, kaleidoscope, all the issues. 
all of them, how deep, and depending on your angle of view, you turn that kaleidoscope, you have a different perspective, and if you're living within it, you certainly have a different perspective of what's in it, but how others view you. So sort of a kaleidoscope. Is this working for you? Because it kind of worked for me in 30 seconds back there. Okay, good. Uh, a prism, right? The, the different ways that you can approach an issue, see an issue, a challenge, an opportunity, a threat, just the prisms that we all think through. I think about the discussions we had about the EU and their issues and their, their interests in the North. Well, why would they? We heard some answers. Belgium, why would they? We heard some answers. So the prisms, the different lights, uh, and the way, the way they're impacted by the way you look through, through things and how you see the North or how the North sees you. If it's still working for you, I've got a fourth word, uh, which is forecast. What, what does the future look like? What does it look like uh, from your perspective, whether you're thinking about it from a security perspective, geopolitics, Ukraine, Russia, what does it look like? What's, what's the forecast for you? I'm not talking about modeling and you know, scenarios that are structured on big data sets. I'm just talking about a forecast. How do you see the North? What are you thinking about the North? What's over the horizon, literally and figuratively? I certainly got the fifth word, which was urgency, depending on you know, your perspective of what's happening in the North and outside of the North. But it was pretty palpable to me that there's a sense of urgency to address, to be involved, to affect change, to be engaged, so a sense of urgency. And the very last one, and then everybody can go off to, to dinner or a few drinks or talk about why did he pick those six words, uh, was action. That's you know absolutely clear, especially with this last panel. Action begets action begets action. Uh, and so investments and what's, what's the value chain towards that, to what end, and then what happens after that? What, what are the actions, whether it's research or politics or investment of dollars? Uh, and, and probably for this context, actions to bring together, like Arctic Futures has, colleagues, that action, action of being here for a couple of days and having great discussions and presentations, and then question what actions we will take when we leave here. And if you're kind of like me, I've come back to uh, my hotel room uh, the night before, because I was in some different meetings last night, and I'll do it again tonight, and no matter how tired we are, I've written down a couple of things that I've taken away each day. So the last, the sixth word would be action. And I think with that, if, it's a, if I'm to close this out, and you need to not come to the microphone again, okay, then I think the last action would be to thank you all uh, for sharing your knowledge, and for uh, the next action, which would be to close this down, and for the actionable stance and to leave and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.